welcome. Aloha. Thanks so much for joining us on Think Tech Hawaii. And please support us if you can, because you are our support and our reason for being, our raison d'etre. We're here to provoke your thoughts and also to hopefully receive them and respond to them. Ultimately, it's really a dialogue. Fortunately, to talk about the importance and the value and the power of stories in conflict resolution, we have with us today two of the premier conflict resolution professionals anywhere, not only in the U.S., but anywhere at all. With ladies first, Leela Love, longtime professor, pioneer of dispute resolution at Cardozo School of Law at Yeshiva University in New York, and now a peaceful resident of New Hampshire, David Hoffman, who in addition to teaching at Harvard has been one of the pioneers in what we call collaborative law. People come to the lawyers only to collaborate and resolve, not to litigate. The adversarial partisan process, attitudes and behaviors are not part of what David offers, what he models, and what he helps to spread, hopefully nationally and worldwide. Leila, you have a story to start us off with on the power of stories. I do. And let me thank you, Chuck, for convening this and David for always being inspirational with stories. I wonder if you started me, David, with your story about the two wolves. But anyway, um, I wanted to tell a story about the first trial in Greek literature. Um, this inspired me so much. I mean, I, I had studied um, Greek mythology and had never heard this story. So I want to share it with you and see, Chuck and David, what you make of this story. If you haven't heard it, I put it in a law school textbook. Here it is. So it's a story about two uh, Greek gods, Apollo and Hermes. So on the night of his birth, his birth, the god Hermes gets out of his crib, takes off his swaddling clothes, and goes and steals the cattle of Apollo. Well, you know, they're hidden, they're removed. Apollo is extraordinarily angry at this and um, snatches up Hermes, who he knows has done it, but he doesn't know where the cattle are, takes him to Zeus, the king of the gods. And he says, punish this guy, you know, fix this guy. This is the first real trial, right, in, in Greek literature. So, you know, Apollo proceeds to say that this baby has stolen Apollo's cattle. Zeus laughs. Oh, I didn't tell you that um, during this so-called trial, Hermes swears a sacred oath that he didn't steal the cattle. Now, oaths, as you know, as we know, are important. So um, Zeus laughs at all this, and he says to the gods, to both of them, Hermes and Apollo, go find the cows. And Hermes, give him back his cows, and you guys make this right. So he's a mediator. He's not acting as an adjudicator or, or arbitrator or judge. He tells them to fix it. So they go off, ordered by Zeus. Hermes shows Apollo where the cows are. And um, to placate Apollo, he, he gives him back his cows, but he also gives him a beautiful tortoise shell musical instrument, a lyre, and teaches him how to play it. He gives him the gift of music and this instrument. Well, Apollo is quite pleased with this. And Apollo gives Hermes um, a staff of wealth and power, a beautiful staff. And um, the gods then 
become close friends and they do many wondrous things together, have many exploits together. And one can conjecture about this story that Zeus doesn't really say, but that Zeus perhaps cared more about harmony and friendship among the gods than he did about the adjudication, punishment, setting precedents, which he could have pursued in, in the trial. Um, so I don't know, I thought this was such a neat story and it had never been taught to me in school. I, let me just one other point. I got very involved in stories because I, put together two books with, with co-editors, one called Stories Mediators Tell. Guess who? Two of the writers were, they were Chuck Crompton and David Hoffman in this <laughs> book, Stories Mediators Tell, have two terrific, terrific stories. Maybe they'll, they'll tell you today. So I wanted to start us with this beautiful and I think pretty unknown story that if it is the first trial that moved into a sort of a mediation between these gods, wow, what an interesting um, place to start. So that's my starting point. I was looking around for my uh, copy of the two uh, stories mediators tell uh, books that uh, you edited and uh, co-edited. Uh, because I, they're never far from my desk. They're wonderful books. I highly recommend them. Uh, I wanted to just comment about the story that you told, Lila, because it um, reflects a piece of truth that I think our uh, culture, legal culture, dispute resolution culture, general culture, doesn't fully appreciate, which is that people who do have the power to adjudicate, namely judges, or in this case, Zeus, um, uh, often serve that mediative role um, and uh, and help uh, get cases uh, resolved. Now, of course, there are some cases that need to have a trial. It might be a test case, uh, et cetera. Um, but what I hear in your story is that Zeus recognized that reconciliation was a more uh, important priority than uh, a articulating justice. Uh, so thank you for that story. It's great. An aspect of justice is the um, social value that's encapsulated in the ideas of people figuring it out how to make things right between themselves. Here, of course, Hermes does go and find the cattle and give them back and gives a gift and gives his friendship and Apollo reciprocates, reciprocates. That is a form of justice. So it's mm -hmm. not as if Zeus abandoned justice. It's that he went to another um, form, if you will, of justice. In some ways, it's, it's a uh, form of restorative justice. So explain so, that a little bit. Restorative justice is a movement in our field that involves uh, the the opportunity, the potential for reconciliation, but also for repair and also for uh, restitution. Um, uh, it has lots of creative possibilities uh, that uh, a simple adjudication uh, doesn't have. And of course, that's the beauty of our dispute resolution movement is that we can think out the outside the box of substantive solutions in the same way that uh, your story uh, illustrates. Uh, we can also think outside the box in terms of what kind of process we use. Uh, so there's a lot of opportunities for uh, creativity. And that's not a slam on the courts. We all know, I think the three of us all agree, the courts play an absolutely vital and under underappreciated role in, in a democracy uh, in this country. And I think mediators make a mistake when they sort of denigrate what goes on in the in the courts and say, oh, you don't want to go there. It's terrible. Um, a lot of important work is done by our judges, and I think we um, don't fully we don't appreciate them enough. No, and your point is really, really important, David. That 
people are not as aware as they should be. The three of us know because we deal with them, both litigators and judges, you will never find a judge, especially a respected judge, who will not say, given the choice between trying a case and helping people resolve it, he will take door number two, resolution, every single time. <laughs> Chuck, don't let me hijack this session, but I was hoping, David... If your distance... <laughs> you're, you're hoping, right? <laughs> David, I was hoping you got me interested in stories, actually, because you, I, I was listening to you once speak at my law school, and you told the story of the two wolves. Mm -hmm. And that story got repeated by me in a variety of settings. I mean, some to groups. Some actually um, in mediations, more in caucus than in joint session. But I don't know I, if it, if we have a chance, sure. that might be a story that would would be wonderful to share I, I, broadly. I have, yeah, I have it on my screen. Let's use that as a closer. So when Chuck says it's time to bring out the hook and bring our <laughs> session to a conclusion. We will close with the story of the two wolves as kind of our benediction. <laughs> good, good. So, yeah. uh, and, and one other comment about the time you told that story. You also were talking about stories, and you said um, the stories are truer, truer than the truth. And you were quoting, <clears throat> I don't know what you were quoting, David, but that's what you said. Yeah. It was. I was quoting Isabel Allende, who uh, made that observation in a TED talk that she gave. But I heard it for the first time from Ken Cloak, one of the spiritual gurus of ADR, as are the two of you, at least in my book. If we were going to compile a list of Hall of Famers in ADR, you two, Ken, John Sturrock. I mean, the list. The list would get pretty long, right? Marvin Johnson. Homer LaRue, just, and the recently deceased, very, very dear friend of ours, Danny, Danny Bowling. Um, that was absolutely for that Danny. Was a big loss yeah. to our field. So what, what is it about stories? What is it in stories? What do they do in and for people that help people connect in so much better ways than the conflict? I've been thinking about this in preparation for uh, today's uh, podcast, and um, I think that stories, uh, in a way, are like metaphors, that they are very powerful because they're kind of indirect. Um, they're, they, they're kind of subversive. They get below the screen of our intellect, where someone's telling us something, and if, you know, and our, let's say we're one of the parties, and we we kind of filter out what the other party says. Consider the source, you know, reactive devaluation. We we resist argument, but you, and you can disagree with an argument, but you can't disagree with a story. It is what it is. Uh, it's an account of something that happened, and and stories have a, a kind of moral valence, a, a moral point um, that's sort of embedded in the story. Sometimes people will understand that and they'll resist it. But um, I want to I uh, sh share with you four types of stories that I find really useful as, as a mediator. Um, and there won't be time to tell, you know, all four of the stories, but I'll just share with you the types. So the first one is a story that actually is in that, that your book, Leela, and it's about a whistleblower. And it's a story that an employee told me in a private caucus session because I asked him about his um, military service. I, I saw it on his resume. And uh, he had been laid off by, a, or fired actually, by a big company. And he told me about his military service in a way that was so engaging. And um, he, he loved being in the military. He retired after 20 years. And... Um, 
by telling me that story, he not only gave me more insight into who he was, but it gave him insight into who he was because he realized that the military really suited him much better than the private sector. So that's a story that we hear separately. It's a story he wouldn't have told in a joint, uh, in a joint session. Um, then there are the stories that I tell. Um, the, the parties are stuck on an um, issue of business valuation, let's say. And I tell them a story about this wonderful couple I worked with who decided that they were going to jointly hire three appraisers. And they were going to sit down with the appraisers and talk with them and really understand how they do their work. And they, after hearing from the three appraisers, they agreed on value. Um, and when I tell that story, people say, huh, we, we could do something like that. Now, I am not proposing that they hire three appraisers. And often they don't. But when we share a story about a successful strategy and conflict resolution, um, we get out of the role, and Leela, I know you've written ab about this, you know, directive and evaluative mediation being an oxymoron. Um, and while I don't completely agree, uh, I think you've made some headway in my thinking. <laughs> you've made some inroads uh, with that uh, wonderful article that you wrote. Um, and, I, and I now, instead of saying, well, would you like, would you be interested in a proposal or an option that I, you know um, uh, I think might be useful here. I tell them a story and it either clicks or it doesn't, but it doesn't feel directive. Um, third kind of story is where the two parties create their own narrative mediation solution. And th there's a whole subset uh, in our field of people who are espouse narrative mediation. And in that school, both parties cre create a common story that explains their dilemma and their solution. A married couple who are getting divorced might, you know, uh, tell a story after, you know, getting away from the story of blame. And, well, you withdrew emotionally. Well, you had an affair or you, you know, stopped working when we needed money all the finger pointing and then and the, and the narrative solution is you know we got married we were kind of young we didn't really know what we were doing we didn't know each other that well we made some bad choices both of us did and when they can tell that common story they can leave their marriage or leave their conflict in a much more peaceful place a place of reconciliation um the final type a fourth type is where the stories are individual stories, like the whistleblower story, but they're different, but they haven't been exchanged. And and this story, if if we have time, uh, Chuck, you tell us. Uh, I, I'd like to tell the story because it was a very moving mediation moment for me. So this was a story about race discrimination, and uh, it wasn't the company that discriminated exactly. It was a customer, a racist customer, uh, who kept coming to this pharmacy, and there was a black pharmacist. Uh, and this customer was making racist comments to the pharmacist. And the pharmacist said to the store manager, you need to ban this person from the store. And the manager refused to do it, just ignored the, the request. And um, uh, finally, the... Um, uh, the pharmacist uh, decided to uh, uh, to quit, and um, uh, the uh, uh, it made it made a, a complaint against the manager. Um, the, the company fired the manager for for his inaction, but the pharmacist was still mad that this had been a hostile workplace, and that she felt that she had to leave uh, because it was so hostile. Um, so the fact that they fired the manager after the fact didn't really satisfy her. Um, there were three stories told in this mediation, and they were told to me in caucus session. And I asked the parties if they would be willing to share these stories with each other. Story number one, the pharmacist uh, said, 
that she had saved someone's life. That's why she, one of the things she loved about being a pharmacist, an elderly person came in, was complaining of headaches, um, and uh, blood pressure was a little high. Pharmacist said, here's some, you know, uh, some medication. But when you get back to your apartment, I want you to call me uh, because this could be something more serious. And if you don't call me, I'm going to send an ambulance. Uh, the customer didn't call the pharmacist. The pharmacist called an ambulance, rescued this elderly woman uh, who had a brain aneurysm. And the pharmacist was smart enough to recognize that that's what it might be. And this uh, woman's life was saved. Now, I thought that was an amazing story. And what was also amazing was it got written up in the newspaper. The pharmacist had never seen it when it came out. But the manager had, this racist store manager, had the article on his desk. And after he was dismissed, uh, the company found this, this article and told the pharmacist, did you know you were in the newspaper for saving someone's life? She said, no, I, I, I didn't know that. Uh, she was very pleased. Second story. The plaintiff's, the, the pharmacist's lawyer said, I grew up, he, he was black. He grew up in, the, uh, in rural North Carolina. His parents were sharecroppers. He said, I saw people mistreated in those fields in ways that uh, I will never forget. And he said, I made up my mind as a young person, I was gonna become a lawyer and I was gonna fight for racial justice. And he said, the only way that people will stop discriminating is if they have to pay for, for the discrimination. And that's why I'm in this case. I'm gonna make this pharmacy pay for the way they mistreated my client. Um, and the third story was the, the company's lawyer who told me privately, you know, I, I went to, a, I lived in a lily white town in the Midwest. I didn't know black people. I didn't know about racial injustice. I went to college. My eyes were opened by it. I decided to major in history and minor in African-American studies. This white guy um, uh, said, I made a point when I came on board this company that racial uh, injustice was going to be, uh, we'd have a zero tolerance policy. And I've made that a priority. I'm here to settle this case and um, and to settle it fairly. And I just thought those stories were quite moving. And I said, you know what, I'd like to convene a joint session. And I asked each person individually, would you share that story? And then uh, I'm not going to ask you to suddenly change your position or anything. I just want you to hear each other's stories. And they said, somewhat skeptically, uh, okay, sure. We got them together and they told these stories and you could hear a pin drop because each person was hearing something they hadn't heard before that was really meaningful. And the case quickly settled after that. So I've learned from that experience that it's important to hear, to uh, elicit people's stories, either in joint or caucus session, and then figure out how they can be instrumental in deepening people's understanding and getting past those walls of resistance, denial, uh, and argument. One of the things that that brings home as the Leela story is, you know, we think about mediation. You know, courts and arbitrators and stuff, they can move money from one place to another. They can move property from one place to another. They can, you know, quantitative stuff. <clears throat> But that's not what we're doing in mediation, in conflict prevention, management, and resolution. Yeah, we are connecting interests and priorities, but they're interests and priorities of people. We're connecting people. That's what the stories that you're talking about do. And the stories remind us of the values that are important to us. If we hear those stories, we have a really good idea of what kind of solution paths might work for these people and which ones will not. Because the stories disclose the values. Because the stories tell us who they are. They're their stories. So we always like to let people do that. And similar to yours, I'll share one quickly. I had a case involving a brain damaged little girl. She was only five at the time of the mediation. And the brain damage occurred a year or two before that, when 
the hospital that she went to it failed to do a head CT and missed the fact that she was having bleeding in the brain. She stroked, she had permanent brain damage. And it was the third time that she was born with some blood vessel problems in the brain, third time that the, the shunt in her brain had failed. So the first two, they'd replaced it in time. The second time, they basically did not evaluate her for two or three hours and they missed it. So the family situation was the father was in the military full time, very, very demanding work in the military. And military is hierarchical, right? So he had people to report to, he had points to make, he had quotas to fill, all that stuff. Very, very demanding. Unfortunately, after the child's brain damage, the mother took the older sister to a pond, a lake, and drowned both of them. So when they came into the mediation, this single father, after the tragedy, oh. with a full-time, very, very demanding, under the thumb of a lot of higher-ups position in the military, was trying to figure out what to do for his daughter and himself. Extremely difficult. <clears throat> so I didn't know that at the start of the mediation. That was not part of the mediation statements. But the first thing I did in the mediation with the father and his attorneys sitting on one side of me and the defense attorneys for the large government institution agency on the other side said, if we could put something together that would allow you and your daughter lives of as much meaning and value as possible, what would that look like? And the father broke down because nobody had ever asked him that question. Nobody had ever tried to offer that or even explore it. So I excused the other attorneys. He told me the story. He agreed, as the people in yours did, to share that story. I brought the other attorneys back into the room. For 45 minutes, we had that same pin drop silence while he told the story. Eh. The lead defense attorney said, Chuck, can we have a minute with you? And so I excused the father and his attorneys. And the lead attorney, very, very intelligent, high position lady, in her organization said, Chuck, I was telling you before the mediation about how wonderful my family life is, how my daughter's doing so well in school, academically, in her rowing, in her music, in all of her life. It's just inspiring. She said, tell you the truth, if I had to come home every day to what he has to come home to, I don't know if I could do it. Stories humanize people because they are human stories. Leela, your story. Zeus treated the people as human beings. It wasn't just go out there and fix it by finding the livestock and returning them. It was you two collaborate together to create your own human solution that's going to work for your human lives. That's what your stories did. That's what the one in my case did. And of course, they settled the case because they had become human beings to each other. There were responsibilities, there were understandings, there were values. And now that we're down to our last few minutes, Lila, want to take first shot? We can listen for a variety of things. We can listen for what are the facts of a given situation. And, you know, I always think the facts are those things that the decision maker determines are facts. I mean, fact, truth is an elusive type of thing. And I think if we charge, um, in this case, mediators, but if we charge people with listening for stories. Stories really motivate people. I think everybody listening to this um, 
podcast is that has stories in their lives. I have a lot of stories. I often wonder if my early stories are true. I mean, I know they're sort of true, but I wonder how factually true each element of the story is. So one thing I would just say in closing to us all, to myself, listen for the story the person is trying to tell rather than referring to the role of, is that true? I don't think that I don't think that point is true. I can prove that's a lie. You know, listen for the story. Um, so I think I'll close with that, and particularly if we're going to be treated to David's rendition of the two wolves. That's beautiful, because listening to stories is listening to people. David, stories help us see and experience people more three dimensionally. And uh, it's one of the reasons why they are truer than truth. Um, uh, so, um, and and one of the thing, one of the truths that the stories express is that we are, we have multiple uh, multiple facets um, as individuals. All of us do. The story of the two wolves captures that point by talking about two facets. But as uh, the two of you know, I. Uh, I'm willing to chew anyone's ear off at any point about the internal family systems model, which talks about our various parts. That can be for another time. Um, but let me read the story of the um, uh, two wolves. Uh, and it's about an, uh, a Cherokee uh, elder uh, who is teaching her uh, grandson about life. And she said, a fight is going on inside me. Uh, she told the, the young boy, fight between two wolves. Uh, the dark one is evil. Uh, anger, envy, sorrow, regret, greed, arrogance, self-pity, guilt, resentment, inferiority, lies, false pride, superiority, and ego. And she continued, the light wolf is good. Uh, that wolf is joy, peace, love, hope, serenity humility, kindness, benevolence, empathy, generosity, truth, compassion, and faith. The same fight, she said, is going on inside uh, you, uh, my grandson, and inside every other person on the face of this earth. The grandson ponders this for a moment and then asks uh, his grandmother, which wolf will win? And the Cherokee elder smiled and simply said, the one you feed. So may we all feed the, uh, the, the, the good, the, the, the light wolf, the good wolf, um, and use our stories and use our client's stories uh, as a force for healing, a reconciliation, uh, understanding, and, and, uh, and good. David Hoffman, Leela Love, thank you so much. I'm going to leave that one right where it is with a quote from one of my favorite singer-songwriters, the late Leonard Cohen. There's a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. Stories help us find those cracks that let the light in. Think Tech Hawaii, thank you so much for joining us. Leela Love, David Hoffman, two of my favorite people anywhere. Aloha.